place. Hallelujah, Lord. He's given you the victory. Healing is in this place. Restoration is in this house. The Spirit of God is in this place. Just shake up the atmosphere for a little bit. Let's just disturb the atmosphere for a little bit. I love me some good church. This is some good church. I, I don't know if y'all understand that. This is some good church. It, it's taking everything in me not to just act crazy up in here. This is some good church. Good Jesus. Woo, visitors, I hope y'all feel that. Woo. Grab the hand of the person beside you, please. Grab the hand of the person beside you. Maybe your help contain them. This is some good church. Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for meeting us right where we are. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for stepping in this place. Yes, Jesus. Allowing us to feel your presence, to bask in your glory, God. To become one with you, Father. Ooh, your spirit is in this place, God. We feel you, Lord Jesus. We feel you working on the inside, moving some things, changing some things, restoring some things, healing some things. God, we feel your presence. You're our solid rock. Yes, Jesus. As we touch the hand of the person in whom we hold, God, we press anointing into that hand and power into that hand father we release strength into that hand god we release an anointing into that hand that breaks yokes and and, and makes changes father and shifts the atmosphere in the areas of our life in which we need you the most god we lift up the deep areas of that person whose hands we're holding not that they've told us god but you're ministering to them by your spirit lord god Thank you, Jesus, for the oneness in this room, the connection that's in this room, the unity that is in this room, that's in the spirit of the true and living God. We pray that every heart would be open and mind and ears would be open and receptive to what the spirit is doing and saying in this place, God. Woo. Continue to infuse us with your power, God and with your revelation and your illumination in our spirit that we will leave this place and never be the same again. That we can leave out of here saying, oh, I've been changed. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. And as I stand and preach and to teach your word, give me power on today and all of my deficiencies and inconsistencies, God. Rise up within me, Father, and allow this presentation to be acceptable in your sight. And now, God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, he is my strength, and I believe him to be your strength. He is my redeemer, and I know him to be your redeemer. 
Let the people of God in this place say amen. amen. Put your hands together one more time for Jesus. Amen. While you're still standing to the book of Genesis, while you're still standing to reverence the word of God to the book of Genesis, thank you, praise team. Genesis 4, 1 through 8. If you need a Bible, just slip up your hand. You should have a note section on the back of your bulletin where you can take some notes, but if you need a notepad, slip up your hand. They'll give you that. We like to teach in this house, and I believe that we are learning week after week. You can share your notes and your revelation. When I was in the back before I came out, I just kept rocking and saying to myself, God, I take this so seriously. I take this so seriously. I just kept saying it over and over again. I don't know about you, but I couldn't even stand and be an usher if I didn't take it seriously, my walk with God. See, some, some of us look at the little bit what we do and we just say, oh, it's about me just standing at the door. It's about me just playing the keyboard. But it's so much more serious than that. We're, we're going to see it today. It's so much more serious than that. So I praise God for the privilege and honor, number one, to be called your pastor and to be able to stand here and proclaim the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Genesis 4, 1 through 8. And we are in our giving series. And last week we talked about the giving life. What a blessed message. Genesis 4, 1 through 8. And it reads this way from the NIV. Adam made love to his wife Eve. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of his fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Cain brought some. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Took from the firstborn. Cain brought some. Abel took from the first, if you get that. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, Will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It, it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and he killed him. In this moment, this morning, I want to preach from the second part of the giving service uh, from the title, The Giving Heart. We'll see it in the text, the giving heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. You can take your seat. We're going to talk about the giving heart. Every time I hear, read, and reflect on John 3.16, it reminds me of just how awesome and gracious God is. What blesses me about what he did is not just that he gave his son but the attitude in which he did it. The Bible says that God so loved, and then he gave. In other words, before he gave the best of what he had as an offering, which was his only perfect and holy son, he gave the best of himself, which was love to his imperfect and unholy prized creation, which was humanity. God's service or ministry didn't start when he offered Jesus, but it started when he made a decision with his heart. And it was his heart that shaped the manner in which he would bless the world. It was a manner in which he would not withhold anything, even if it was his only son. It was a manner in which he would risk sending his best to save the worst. It was a manner that insisted that sending Jesus had to happen regardless of what he thought because in his heart he wanted to give Jesus because he loved us that much. So now when someone asks us, why did Jesus die on the cross? We can emphatically declare, because God loved me. 
because he loved me dirty. He loved me angry. He loved me when I was a gang member. He loved me when I was a prostitute. He loved me when I was addicted to drugs. He loved me when I was involved with alcoholism. He loved me when I was an abuser. While I was without strength and I was a sinner, all I know is that God loved me. No one would acquit me of all of my sins and declare me righteous and look beyond my faults and see my need for them unless they loved me first. I believe God didn't just want us to know what he was offering, but the intent behind him offering Jesus so that he could teach us a principle about the offering of our heart and how it affects how we give. Our heart can be presented as an offering unto the Lord. And it is out of that pure and contrite heart that an outward demonstration of giving is displayed that pleases God. If God was only pleased with what you offered and how you offered it, we would think that somehow God is in need of what we bring to him to stroke his ego or somehow appease him. But yet God is not satisfied until our hearts and our lives begin to reflect who he is. Our outward presentation can never be a cover-up for the inward transformation that God desires out of each and every one of us. God doesn't want us doing stuff and bringing him something. He wants us being spirit-led so that we give him exactly what he wants. When you try to offer something unto God while your heart is not in alignment and agreement with God, you are missing the lesson that God is trying to show in giving him an offering. God wants you to see that when you offer something to him, the presentation should mirror what is in your heart. And when you present something that is not representative of what is in your heart, then you are saying that I'm trying to fool God and hope he doesn't catch on to who I really am. And you're also saying that I'm trying to fool man so that they see me as more spiritual, as that they see me as more close to God or in a better relationship than what I really am. But see, man looks on the outer things, and they may be impressed, but it is God who looks at the heart. And when a person fails to confront matters of the heart, there is an unwillingness to deal with your deficiencies and defects in your walk with God. So you have to work harder at presenting your offering. You have to work harder at presenting your service and your gift and your abilities and your church position, but you never get it right. Because what you're trying to offer God can only be done in a way in which he accepts. And the revelation can only come into a heart that is open enough to receive it. I'm preaching some deep stuff in here. In other words, you will toil and still miss it. You'll get turned away. You'll be rejected. You'll be stuck at a certain level or hit a wall in your ministry or your service unto the Lord because you are functioning in a dysfunctional manner because of your heart issue and your heart is at the core of how you operate. This is why the Bible declares in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, watch this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoer. Notice that even through your best ministry unto the Lord, you stand the chance of being categorized as an evil doer. If at the core of what you do, you are not doing the will of God, basically you have missed it. He said that you will be considered an evil doer. It's not that the prophesying is evil. It's not that the preaching is evil because you're doing something, but at the heart of who you are, you're evil. So you are an evil doer evil preacher, evil teacher, evil prophesier. You are an evil doer. And this may be too heavy for y'all today. And so this is the case with Cain in the text. He and Abel, God, thank you, Jesus. He and Abel both had jobs. Abel kept the flocks and Cain worked the soil. But it seems that no matter how hard Cain worked at growing the best crops, Reevaluating the process, 
making sure that his fruits and vegetables were as plump and juicy and colorful as they could be by constant evaluation, inspection, and diligence, God would not accept his offering. After all of that, God would not accept his offering. And what I'm trying to help us to understand is that every offering from your pocket your gift or your ministry, whether it be music, preaching, ushering, sound and video, whatever, it may not be looked upon favorably or be accepted by God because though you are working hard at it, though you are staying up late at night and you find yourself reevaluating the process, making sure that all your I's are dotted and that all your T's are crossed and you're diligent at it, watch this. If you fail to reevaluate your heart, and get it right with God, you will always present God something that is second best because first and foremost, God wants the total you, which is your heart, your mind, and your soul. God wants your heart. So what does the giving heart look like? I'll show it to you in the text. The giving heart, first of all, insists on giving God its best. The giving heart insists on giving God its best. During the time that Cain and Abel would give unto the Lord, there was not yet a law to instruct them on the manner in which they were to give. However, though there was no written law, God is always able to speak his law, his will, and his commands into a heart that is receptive to him. Both Cain and Abel would present an offering to God. But there was something different between the two brothers that God assessed and determined he would take one sacrifice over the other. It can't be that God required blood just because that's what he did to cover Adam and Eve. But there is something deeper in the text. The Bible says that Cain gave some of what he had worked on, but that Abel gave the first of what he had worked on. Cain gave some of what he worked on, but Abel gave the first of what he had worked on. Cain gave God leftovers while Abel gave God his best. What each of them gave was determined by what was in their heart to do. The implication here is that Abel probably excelled at hearing understanding and knowing the will of God because there was no area in his heart that he would hold back from God. Make sense? The converse of that is Cain who hears and understands and knows more about what he wants or he thinks God should have from him because God didn't have access to his whole heart. Oh, I'm preaching it. Abel's attitude suggests that in his heart, he saw God as worthy of the best the first thing of all he had. And because of this, he would rather give his best to God to a God that gave his best to him than keep it for himself. This is a type of revelation that can only come from spending time with God. A person that insists on giving God their best is a person that has no off-limit areas in their heart where God cannot reach because that person understands that they are only as good as their heart. So the key to insisting that God gets his best offering from you, whether it be money or ministry, is to insist that God have all of your heart. You have to wake up every day saying, God, I need you to speak to the pain of my past. I need you to speak to the pride that I exude because I don't want to fail. God, I need you to speak to the anger that I have because I've been disappointed so much. God, I need you to speak to the fear that I have because things seem to always turn out bad. To speak to the unforgiveness I harbor because I've been hurt so deeply. You have to invite God in to speak to your heart so that he can clean it up and renew a right spirit within you. And it is out of that spirit that you present something to God that he finds favor in. Ooh, I'm preaching. And you will realize that God finds favor in seeing the best of you because the best of you reflects him and his ways and he can't deny himself. Woo. Woo. The giving heart insists on giving God his best. But watch this number two. The giving heart does something else. The giving heart is influenced by spending time with God. Woo. 
the giving heart is influenced by spending time with God. In order for Abel to know what God was looking for when he gave an offering, he had to spend time with God, which ultimately influenced his giving. That just makes good sense. When you spend time with God, his influence becomes your influence. And what you knew is replaced by what you know now. And that is the rule in how you operate or walk with God. It is impossible to know the how of God when you don't know the what of God. How do you know what God desires from you if you don't know what he desires of you? You have to come to God. You have to stay in his presence. You have to hear his voice. You have to reflect on what he desires and become one with him to the point that his thoughts and his ways have found a home in you. Woo, I'm preaching it up in here. Psalms 37.4 helps us out. It says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Let me tell you, the text says that your heart, I'm going to break this down. Your heart has the capacity to receive God's desires when you delight yourself in the Lord. That's what that says. Your heart has the capacity to receive God's desires when you delight yourself in the Lord. Because don't think that God is worried about giving you your desires. Amen. Because to delight yourself in the Lord means that you rule out or that you push out any desire that is not of him or from him. This means that you don't walk around conflicted, which means that you have two competing desires, but you stand with a conviction that you live and operate under the influence of a God who fills your heart with his words, his laws and commands and desires because he is the one in whom you delight. The problem with Cain and Abel is that while God was outside the door of Abel's heart, opening it up as he pleased and pouring in his will, sin was crouching outside the door of Cain's heart, ready to overtake him. That's in verse 7. Sin was so close to Cain that it was speaking to him from the other side of the door. And rather than ruling over it, he received it to the point in which he killed his brother. And can I just say that before you get caught up by sin, that there is the opportunity for you to rule over it. Sin is crouching outside your door, but it can't stand up and come in the door unless you give sin power. Sin has to crouch because it is submissive to the power and authority of God. And it is a small thing that becomes a big thing when our desire conceives with temptation and it births sin. You have to resist the devil and he will flee from you. And when you move from him, you've got to move to God. So that as you hear his voice less, you will hear God more. And the influence on your life will be all of God minus your agenda and the enemy's agenda. Because see, God is not crouching down anywhere. He manifests himself everywhere. And as a believer, he is inside you. So stop trying to squish God down and just open up your heart and let God be magnified in your heart, be magnified in your life, and let God be magnified in what you are doing. We're talking about the influence here. God should be your greatest influence. This is a thinking message. I don't need you to shout as long as you're listening and taking notes. But the last thing about the giving heart, the giving heart is intentional in its giving. The giving heart is intentional in its giving. The, the giving heart must be specific, strategic, deliberate, and purposeful. There is intentionality behind this type of giver because of the condition of the heart. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, that each man should give or woman should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The decision to give and the parameters of the giving are not something that is tossed around recklessly or doesn't have a targeted purpose, but it is at the heart that directs the giving. Did y'all get that? It's not something that's just tossed around, but it's just the heart 
There's an intention in the heart that says, this is the way that I've decided to give. It is purposeful. It is strategic. Is it deliberate? This is the way that I have decided to give. The decision that comes from our heart should be from a heart whose desires come from the Lord. Because God's way of giving is never reluctant. It's never under compulsion, but it's always cheerful. When Jesus endured the cross, the Bible says that for the joy that was set before him. This means that Jesus smiled in his heart when he was suffering on the cross because he loved us and could already see the harvest that would come unto him and reign in heaven with him. Yes, he was smiling in his heart the whole time. He was purposeful. He was intentional. He was deliberate. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He did it for a reason. He was intentional. God doesn't want us holding back. I'm sorry. I believe that God desires so much for us to make a heart decision with our giving that it is influenced by him, that from giving our last two pennies to giving your thousands and everything in between, God will still be pleased as long as your heart is lined up. Remember the story about the young lady that sat on the front row and it said that the people came by and they were giving their plenty, they were giving a lot, and Jesus sat there. He watched the whole offering and all she gave was her last two pennies. She gave all that she had. But as long as those people's heart were in the right place and her heart was in the right place, it didn't really matter that she only gave two pennies and they gave a lot because God was concerned about her heart. If you think about it, what kind of crazy woman was that for Jesus? She must have been radical for Jesus to sit there in that offering and say, this is all I have. I can't buy any bread. I don't know if I can trade it or something. But because of my heart is for the Lord, I'm willing to deposit this in the kingdom so that God can deposit something back into my life. Oh, the heart. Pastors, I'm speaking to you prophetically if you watch this. You got to stop stomping on people because they're not giving the way that you think they should and not trying to think about whether their heart is in alignment to their giving. Stop worrying people, tell them about how cursed they are and how their family is that are going to be cursing, how their lineage is going to be cursed. Stop speaking to them that way. Preach truth to their lives and preach to their soul and to their spirit so that their heart gets right, so that when they come up to the basket, they're not coming out of compulsion because you said it. They're not coming out of any other condition except their heart is open before the Lord. And if God says give it, he's going to give it. He may have said, give your best $5, and you're trying to force people to hold up a $500 line. If you gave your best five and your heart was unto the Lord, God is pleased with that. I'm sorry I had to go there. God is pleased with that. God doesn't want us holding back in our giving, but he doesn't want us holding back giving our heart over to him so that our total presentation unto him will find favor in his eyes. You, you know, Christians are funny. We, we like to see what man thinks about us when we put on a good presentation before God. Look at what I just gave. Look at what I just presented before the Lord. Look how glamorous I am. Look at my presentation. It looks so holy. It looks so devout. This is the thing that God wants. And God is saying, you stink. God is saying, I didn't ask for that. Yes, you did. You gifted me this way. I didn't ask for that. What are you talking about, Lord? I didn't ask for that, that which is in you that you never seem to deal with. When you present yourself to me, don't think I'm looking at the glamour on the outside. I'm looking at the heart that's on the inside. And if you can't get your heart that's on the inside right, don't even show yourself up here. There's no ministry without your heart because you're doing it for men to see. But what about what I wanted to see? Because when I created you, I had a purpose for you in mind. You think you're fulfilling your purpose because you get applause by what man sees, but you have yet to get an applause from me. I'm still sitting on my throne and I haven't gotten up to cheer you on like man does because I'm not pleased with what's in your heart. God, stop speaking to me.
God is concerned about what is in <laughs> what is in our heart. Cain held back his heart from God. And rather than dealing with what was internal, his heart issue, he got rid of something external, the issue he had with his brother, when in reality, his brother was never the problem. Could it be that in the church, we look around at what God is accepting from others and favoring? because we have put so much time and effort in our presentation, but it never seems to experience the blessings that others receive. And rather than looking inward, we attack our brothers and sisters in Christ because they are making us look bad. And that is not even their intent. They just have what God wants, and that's their whole heart. We do this. Everybody's looking around at what God is pleased with and who he's favoring and who he's blessing and who he's exalting. And then we attack one another. You think you're better than me. I'm going to try to outdo you. And the whole time, you never seem to get it. You haven't got it yet. I know you haven't got it because you're still competing. You're still looking for the next opportunity. You're still looking to try to overshadow. You're still looking to try to be better. And God says, you can't be better until your heart gets better. I've been watching this thing evolve in church for so many years. How does God send his son Jesus to die for an unworthy people that couldn't find righteousness on our own? even when he gave us laws, couldn't do it. But all of a sudden, we're so worthy. When we're in Christ Jesus, we're so glamorous all of a sudden. And we act almost as if somebody didn't do that for us. How do we get to that place? Let me tell you how God set this up for, for revelation and how he confirmed in me the text and the message for today. Not last week when I thought of the text, but actually within the tw last 24 hours in a conversation. God let me know through a conversation that he's concerned about the heart and not about what we bring up in here. So you can't come up in here. I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to minister. I'm ready to bring an offering and leave your heart outside somewhere. Because that will be some of the most empty service that you will ever present unto the Lord. Imagine this making a withdrawal of a million dollars out of the bank, putting it in a big old bag and bringing it unto the Lord and say, this is what you require. And God looks at that million dollars and says, I don't see anything. A million dollars that you would be excited about. What are you talking about? I don't see anything in the bag. God, is just what you wanted, is what you required, is what you asked me to give, God. I don't see anything. 
deal with your heart first so that even if you come back to me with that one dollar I'll be pleased if you approach me with that big old bag with that one dollar <laughs> then you approach me with that million dollars in your heart not be right Woo! y'all y'all I don't know if y'all got that you can't sing as good as some but the some that are singing hearts ain't right but you stand up here with your cracked voice you just trying to get over a little bit but God told you that's what he wanted you to do was sing that song you have more anointing and power in your voice than the person that stands up there that was trained at Berkeley and doesn't have a heart for the Lord people may be entertained but they won't be moved they may be lifting their hands, but their hearts won't be stirred on the inside to make a decision for Jesus. I'm preaching up in here. Woo. We need to make a decision today that God will be ruler of our heart. And by doing that, he will rule are giving and this will be the thing that he will accept because he can't deny himself how can he deny the fact that when he looks at you he sees himself remember God doesn't need anything the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof he can deny what you bring to him but he can't deny himself that he sees in you Woo. Oh, yes. The giving heart. We want people to give in here more than money. Give your time. Give your gift. Whatever God has purpose for you to give. But let's deal with the heart. And you know how I can tell when your heart is right and you're giving? You don't have that spirit of trying to overshadow and pass people up. But you look back and when you see someone else's heart isn't right. You don't look at that as an opportunity to get ahead of them. You look at that as an opportunity to reach back, and, oh, I'm preaching, and pull them up until they can get their heart in a place so that what they present unto the Lord is something that he will accept. Because in this church, it's not about him accepting it from you and from you and from you and from you. We wanted him to accept it collectively from us as a church. God receive Wissick's offering unto the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Right where you are, bow your heads. Father God, your spirit is in this place. You have spoken to us through your word prophetically, God. You've given us truth in which to live by and to stand on. Thank you, Jesus. With all heads bowed and eyes closed. The altar is open right now for prayer. It may be time for some heart surgery in this building. And there's nothing to be embarrassed about. People can have a nice natural heart for a long time. Be doing all the right things. And their heart have a bad moment. And it needs to be tended to and cared for and strengthened again. So it can beat back properly. What's the same with the people of God? You could have started out right in this thing. But somewhere along the way, your heart began to get bad. Maybe it was the cares and the desires of this world. But maybe you're saying today, I need God to deal with my heart. I've been churching it. I've been looking like church, smelling like church. I've been offering something unto the Lord. But now when today I realize it was nothing. Because God wasn't looking at what I brought. He was looking at me. Give me your holy Maybe you're here today, you're saying, I need to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. 
I want God to change my heart of stone. I want him to write his words on my heart that I might not sin against him. You're saying, I need Jesus on today. I want to confess with my mouth Jesus Christ and believe that God raised him from the dead with all power in his hands to cover my sins so that I wouldn't go to hell, but that I would have a right to the tree of life. If you're here today and you've never been saved, you're saying, I need to receive Christ. Maybe you don't know, you're not sure you need to get up here. Receive Jesus Christ on today. He's after your heart. Out of God's heart, he gave Jesus. And now he's calling you unto himself. Maybe you're here today, you're saying, I need a church home. I need a place where I can learn and grow and be loved on. I need a place where I can be exalted. And even a place where I can be reproved and rebuked at times to bring me back to the place where God would have me to be. And you're saying that this is that place. This is the place where I want to work and lay down some roots and be all that God has called me to be. General prayer, if you need salvation, if you desire to be a member of Wissick, maybe you're here to rededicate your life to Christ. I'm saved, but I could do better. I strayed away for a while. Some people wouldn't know it because they saw me offering something all the time. But like the prodigal son today, I want to come to myself and realize that I don't have to stay where I am, but I can go back to my father's house where grace and mercy is available unto me. The same love is available unto me. The same provision is available unto me. Thank you, Jesus. Speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus. Speak to us. Speak blessings over each.